Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, my name is Karen Mathis, and it's really a pleasure to be here today. My role in ICME is working with companies. We have about 30 uh, industry affiliates, as well as national labs and other groups, and building meaningful collaborations throughout the year. And if there's anything you've heard today, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it uh, after Expo, if you'd like to discuss further. So today I wanted to talk about a new seminar series that I co-taught um, with ICME this past winter quarter called AI for Good. And we had several different goals for that seminar series. And let's see if I can, yep, move it the slide along. We had a number of goals. Uh, inspiring students was very important. We really wanted them to think about how they could tie their coursework and how perhaps in the future they could apply what they're learning in AI to solve some of the world's biggest challenges in the environment, in economic areas, in society. We also wanted to expose the interdisciplinary nature of AI and we actually invited students from all across campus to join us for this seminar series uh, from the humanities, science, uh, from many different areas to get involved. Um, that multidisciplinary nature, I think really will help to lessen the chance for unintended consequences in these solutions and build better robust solutions overall. And finally, we wanted to encourage greater diversity in AI First, because we've seen studies that show that diverse teams outperform other teams in these areas. And also because it's really important that everyone has a seat at the table when these important decisions are being made around AI and data science that are really shaping our world for the foreseeable future. So we had a large turnout every week, um, starting in January where this photo was taken. It seems like years ago and definitely no social distancing, but we had students from all seven schools in the class, um, undergrads, as well as graduate students. And we also had staff and faculty from Stanford, as well as our ICME affiliate partners like you all who were invited to attend the class. If you didn't have a chance to attend, we have all our videos on our ICME YouTube channel. You can check it out later. And we were delighted to see that 33% of the students were female. That was a big increase from last year when we had a class AI in real life, uh, which was only 21% female. So we think that building diversity, one way to do that is to emphasize um, ways that AI solutions can benefit all of us in society. So there were three main elements to the seminar series. And I'll just briefly share those. First, we had 19 wonderful speakers across many diverse areas. We also had a number of supplemental readings for the students. And we included for the first time Jupyter Notebooks in our seminar series. These were optional, but allowed students to explore more hands-on um, issues like fairness and bias. So if you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, this is an open source web-based application. Basically it allows you to combine um, data, uh, equations, live code, usually in Python, uh, data visualization and some text, and the students could do what if scenarios. Every week we feature different use cases and we really tried to go beyond the headlines. Uh, many students commented it was great to see things highlighted other than autonomous vehicles. And I'll just mention a few here. One example was in nonprofits. We had a wonderful speaker talk about using an NLP solution in a crisis hotline. So as they're scaling their phone system, they had been using a first in first out FIFO model of queuing. And they realized that they should be looking at how they prioritize the calls and put the highest risk case up front. And that's sort of how they're using AI now. And what I thought was most important there is that they really thought through how they built trust with their users about these new technologies. And we heard that theme throughout the, uh, the seminar series. Trust was so key to build. Um, this group did it in three ways. First, they showed some concrete success with the results. 
And at the same time, they also share the limitations of this technology, that it wasn't going to be a panacea. And finally, they involve the users from the very beginning and help them to understand why they were applying these new technologies to make their system even better. Another great talk was by uh, Professor Marzia Garcemi uh, from the University of Toronto and the Vector Institute. She talked about solutions in healthcare. Um, some examples you've heard this morning. Um, I was uh, surprised to hear that already the FDA has approved over 40 different algorithms for usage. And one example that Marzia explained was a digital stethoscope to um, allow uh, the doctors to look at heart murmurs and atrial fibrillation and predict those better. Uh, one thing that uh, Professor Gassemi brought up was the, the strong need for trade-offs, um, not being able to optimize for everything. And I'll discuss some of those trade-offs later on. That was a common theme throughout the entire series. And finally, in government, we had a fantastic talk by two Stanford faculty in the law school, uh, Professor Ho and Engstrom, um, with a new study that they just released. So I'm happy to share it with any of you about AI usage in government. And in the US, the aha there was that almost half of all federal agencies and departments are now experimenting with AI, so 45%. And there are some really interesting use cases, about 160 different use cases already. So there's some big opportunities there. Um, we heard about chatbots for the Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, autonomous vehicles for the Postal Service, um, and many applications around adjudication, such as for veterans affairs or for welfare recipients. Um, so that was an area where the um, agencies were definitely looking for more involvement from academia and collaboration there, and also working with contractors. I think 50% of them were working with outside contractors. So I think we're just at the beginning of a lot of great development work there. We had a number of responsible AI themes and those were discussed from the very first session and then throughout the seminar series. Uh, for instance, on fairness, um, we shared with students a video about the 21 different mathematical definitions of fairness. Um, it's really hard to optimize for all different types of fairness. And so there were some trade-offs and some prioritization that needs to be made. That was one interesting area. We talked about reproducibility and the importance of robustness of these solutions, as well as conveying again, the limitations. And in ICME, our analogy is likening it to a data highway where you're barreling down at 120 miles an hour, and you may be hitting all these um, road impediments or potholes that you might be blindsided by. So thinking through these carefully up front is really important. And I'll leave you with four key takeaways that we gleaned from the seminar series. The first being that AI is definitely a great, but only one tool in the toolbox and really important to convey what the solution can and cannot do. And I know I've heard from a number of you, uh, especially in companies um, where a well-meaning department person will come and say, we need a CNN solution, a deep learning solution for this particular problem. But then when you start unpeeling the onion and looking at what really needs to be solved, um, and uh, there may be some different solutions that might be uh, less costly, less compute intensive, and might actually do a better job. So really trying to understand what's the best tool. The second takeaway that we heard and we shared with students throughout is the need for frameworks. Um, often we're focused on the technical and the scientific part, and that's really important, but also looking at ethical frameworks, both at the personal level, like should there be a Hippocratic oath for data scientists, and machine learning experts, um, but also at the organizational level, level and we shared with students a number of those frameworks and guiding principles. I'd love to hear if you all are using some particular frameworks that are working. Um, we're collecting those and please uh, feel free to send them to me. And finally, policy frameworks to guide in the decision making and how important that was. The third takeaway is on the trade-offs that often need to be made and you can't maximize everything in these uh, solutions. 
Certainly privacy was discussed throughout and opposed as uh, compared to healthy outcomes, for instance, in ICU intensive care units and some trade-offs there. Or one speaker discussed overall accuracy, but then suggested, is it okay if the overall accuracy is let's say 70%, but it's 90% accurate for white uh, constituents and only perhaps 50% accurate for everyone else? Is that um, acceptable? So really grappling with those accuracy measurements. And then finally, transparency. There were a lot of ahas there. Like for instance, in some government agencies where being too transparent might not be the best approach. For instance, with the IRS, where you might have people gaming the system. Or Professor Gassemi brought up that sometimes a simplistic, uh, easier to understand uh, solution may not actually be the best solution and you might really need a more complex solution. People may end up going to the simplistic solution. They can understand it. They might over trust it, but is that necessarily the right thing? So there are a lot of nuances that we discussed throughout the course. And finally, uh, that this multidisciplinary approach is absolutely critical. You know, asking those key questions like, who are all the constituents who have to have a stake in the solution and what is their input? Also, how is success measured um, beyond the accuracy? And again, what are those important trade-offs? And finally, what is the cost of failure? And particularly for some groups of people versus others, perhaps marginalized populations. So in summary, um, we heard some great feedback from the students. Uh, that hopefully they'll take this new understanding and critical thinking and apply it when they leave Stanford in the design of uh, AI solutions, uh, thinking about these key takeaways. Uh, a number of people have asked me, okay, we did an AI for good seminar series. Now, should we do an AI for bad seminar series? Uh, interesting idea, you know, with fake news and killer drones but we don't have any plans yet, so don't hold your breath. But thank you for listening. I'd like to say that there's great content available. Please check out the ICME YouTube channel uh, for our videos. I'm happy to share the readings or check out this um, website with a summary uh, articles one of our PhD students did on every different session. And a big thank you to all our co-sponsors. There was a lot of cooperation from groups across campus as well as we had some generous support from Google to make this all happen. So thanks again to everyone. And then I'd like to open it up for questions at this point. Well, let's see, we've got one question so far, and that question is regarding environmental solutions. Um, are there any key ones that were addressed during this uh, seminar series? That's a great question. Um, we had a fantastic talk um, including Professor Stefano Ehrman um, at Stanford and uh, Lucas Joppa, who is the CEO, Chief Environmental Officer of Microsoft. And it was fascinating. One of the biggest challenges that they discussed was uh, getting good data. And um, one low hanging fruit, according to Professor Ehrman, was using satellite data, particularly from new satellite systems like Planet and how that kind of satellite data could perhaps help us to inform on crop yields uh, in many parts of the world where that's really critical. Um, it could help inform on infrastructure, water, electricity. Um, it could even inform on issues around refugees and migrations of refugees around the world. And so, um, you know, how can we best leverage this new data to really fill in the holds from traditional research that's going on? So that was a really inspiring talk. And so I guess I'll end there. Um, and it's my great pleasure now to introduce Professor James Zhao. Uh, professor Zhao is assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Data Science in the School of Medicine, and also by courtesy in the Computer Science and EE Electrical Engineering Department. He uh, hails from Harvard where he received his PhD and before that, he received level three mathematics at Cambridge, has um, a number of accolades and an undergrad at Duke, I believe, in mathematics and physics. 
Um, it's a pleasure to have him back here. Uh, Professor Zhao has been involved in Expo several times in the past. His work is on machine learning, a lot of really interesting computational health areas. And he also has done great work addressing some of these unintended consequences about fairness and bias. So with that, I'll hand it over to Professor Zhao. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Karen. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm excited to have a chance to tell you a bit about some of the recent projects in my group. Uh, so this is a picture taken of my students. This is our last board game night before the, before the pandemic. Uh, and in particular, I'll tell you about two projects that we recently published in NIPS, New RIPS, and that we also, uh, I think also quite potentially interesting to the audience here. So the first project would be following up on the theme of AI for healthcare, how do we develop actually video-based AI systems to assess heart function. So this was first published in a New York workshop, and then we recently published this in Nature last month. The second project is about how do we actually get to uh, forget individuals from AI algorithms. So heart disease is the leading cause of death in the US, right? So it's accountable for one in every four deaths in this country. And echocardiograms, which are basically heart ultrasound, is basically the most commonly used methodology to assess how well the heart is functioning. Right? So this is routinely used in over, uh, you know, in many in many hospitals. So it's, there are over 10, 000, 10, 10 million of these ultrasounds done every year in the U.S. And each one is actually fairly expensive, right? It costs over a thousand dollars. So. I'll, I want to tell you about what we've done to develop AI systems to assist in analysis of these heart ultrasounds or, or these echocardiograms. How these heart ultrasound works is that uh, the cardiologist will have to look at the, the heart, right? So it's basically, and they have to trace out manually the chambers of the heart to see when is the heart, how large is it when it's the largest, fully expanded, and the size when it's the most compact, right? And based on that manual tracings, the clinician can then get a score that indicates how well is the heart functioning. And as you can imagine, there's actually quite a bit of heterogeneity across different ultrasound. Right? So here I have four example ultrasound from four different patients at Stanford. Right? So they're all subtly and different. And it's also, there's a lot of heterogeneity across different clinicians, right? because people have different patterns of tracing and it's also quite time intensive. So that really motivated our work, right? So the goal is to really design an uh, AI system, right? That can autom automate the analysis of these heart ultrasound. Uh, and this is the paper that's really led by two fantastic students in the group. So David, he's actually an MD, and Brian, who's a CS PhD student in my group. So basically what we did in this system is that we wanted to really mimic the current clinical workflow for a cardiologist as much as possible. All right, so what that means is that instead of just trying to take this uh, ultrasound and have a full, you know, like a pure black box to predict the cardiac function just from the ultrasound, we wanted to actually build a system in a way that's actually interpretable to clinicians. And the way we try to do this is to actually have two workflows in parallel. Right? So the bottom workflow is that we realize that the clinicians currently have to do these tracings of the boundaries of the heart chambers, right? So we actually try to do the tracings automatically as a part of the algorithm. And then the top arm of the algorithm is basically a spatial convolutional network that can take as input these different tracings and then estimate the heart function, which is in the form of this ejection fraction uh, over time. And that actually works really well, right? So, Here's just an example output that's produced by our AI system, right? So the, you see here the original ultrasound on the right, and then we have the annotations, which is the segmentations produced by the, our algorithm on the left. And then the end is also basically spits out a score that estimates the, essentially the functioning, how well the heart is functioning. Okay, so just very quickly, if you want to really deploy these AI systems medical settings as we're trying to do here at Stanford. Right? So I think it's actually really important to really try to, to evaluate the system very carefully. Right? So the first thing we try to do is to really evaluate it using data that comes from a different hospital. And ideally we want to evaluate the system using data from a different hospital without having to modify the system, right? just off the shelf. We also want to give the, the system the noisiest kind of data that we could find, right? and also to really understand the outliers. 
And we evaluate the system on data from uh, actually from a hospital in Los Angeles to show that actually it has essentially very similar performance scores, right? So AUC around 0.96, and then compared to the data that we tested from Stanford. And lastly, we've also released the whole data set, which is currently one of, currently the, one of the largest publicly available uh, data sets of medical videos, over 10,000 of these hard ultrasound videos. So anyone and any of you could actually access this data as well as you can access our algorithms, which are all open source. So the second part I want to just quickly mention is that um, oftentimes when we're working with medical data, especially, right, we have quite strong regulations about patients uh, not wanting their data to be used and they're in certain applications. So here I'm just showing you one example email that I received, which requested that actually uh, patient, uh, that certain algorithms stop using data from particular individuals, where the individuals can request have their data not being used. And this is also part of the European Union's GDPR as well as the California Consumer Privacy Act. And this is actually really challenging to do in practice, right? Because if a particular individual says they don't want their data to be used, then we could, and they want their data to be deleted, then we, it's easy to delete their data just from you know, a row. One minute. Tool. But it's actually very hard to modify the algorithms to remove their data. And that's a big problem because we know that machine learning algorithms are really good and really effective at memorizing different types of training data. Right? So if you don't remove the data from the trained algorithms, then you effectively have not actually deleted the data. So you haven't actually complied with, this, uh, with the regulations, the policies. And that's actually a big problem that many of the companies, right, from Facebook to Google, they're all struggling with now, is how to actually modify the algorithms when requested by users to delete their data. So in this recent work that we published at NeurIPS last December, right, we proposed sort of the first formal framework to define rigorously what does it actually mean to delete data from a trained machine learning model, which in our context just means that the model after you delete the data should have exactly the same behavior as if the model has never seen this data point before in the past. Right, so it, here's just an example. If you delete this data point, I want to really update my model to, so that it has the same behavior as if I've never seen this training point. And this is actually quite hard to do in practice, right? So really, there, previously, the only known way to do this deletion is to retrain the whole model from scratch. And what we did in this NeurIPS paper is to actually propose some of the first efficient algorithms that allow people to delete data from trained machine learning models without actually having to retrain the model from scratch. Right? So this actually leads to sort of several types, several orders of magnitude speed ups in the efficiency of deleting data. So that enables people to actually to comply with these policies and to delete users' data in real time. So this is just sort of quick, uh, maybe quick intros into these projects and share the references if you're interested to learn more about it. Okay, great. And then I want to take um, a little bit of time now also to introduce uh, several fantastic ICME students. So if the students could also um, uh, sort of unmute yourselves on, on online. So, and then, so we have three students, PhD students from ICME, Tatiana, Jungji, and Ines. And I'll ask each of them now to just say a little bit about uh, well, the, their recent research projects. So we'll start with a project from Tatiana. Um, hi, so uh, this uh, paper is called Distributional Reinforcement Learning for Energy-Based Sequential Models. So the problem is that uh, autoregressive models are very good in capturing uh, local features, but bad in capturing uh, global features. So um, we had two problems to tackle. How could we, uh, namely, uh, how could we incorporate some uh, global features into autoregressive models? And eventually, how could we efficiently uh, sample from them? And how could we uh, uh, make inference? So as a result, we ended up uh, introducing GAM, and GAM is Global Autoregressive Model, which is like a normalized potential. So it has the autoregressive part R, as you see, and it also has this uh, log, uh, log, uh, log potential function. And um, because of this, uh, this GAM gives us uh, some kind of uh, soft filtering over the uh, probabilities derived by uh, autoregressive models. 
and uh, in the paper uh, introduced in New Ribs, we were trying to investigate another way of sampling from gum because gum is a normalized, so we cannot easily sample from it. And to do that, we introduced something called distributional RL, uh, distributional policy gradient, and namely, instead of uh, just simply optimizing for uh, for the reward, and in our case, uh, the best uh, interpretation of reward is to maximize this potential uh, given by gum. We implicitly minimize the cross-entropy between the normalized uh, distribution provided by gum and our policy. But since we don't have the normalized distribution, we have to um, we have to be smart about it, and um, we do a policy gradient. So uh, yeah, that's about it. Okay, great, thank you. And then we have uh, Jun Ji. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, so um, the work we uh, wrote in for the New York uh, is called the Learning Through Games. And in that work, uh, our major uh, goal is to combine reinforced learning and mean field games to solve large population multi-agent reinforcement problems. And um, oh, by the way, a mean field game is just a, a limit of empire game where n goes to infinity. And people have used it to solve uh, problems in finance and other fields uh, with no model uh, for like decades. And um, um, so the motivation is pretty straightforward. Um, suppose that we are demand side platform like Google uh, search engine, like YouTube and uh, uh, Amazon. And um, we have a lot of ad beaters and um, um, they uh, have some unknown distributions uh, of like, for, for example, their uh, conversion of clicks and uh, other things. Um, that uh, even the platforms like Google does not know completely. And the question is just basically how should one bid um, and how should Google or like these kind of platforms uh, inform or suggest those bidders to bid in a repeated ad auction game um, with a large population and also unknown distributions of those kind of uh, underlying parameters like conversion per clicks. And the solution we propose is combining reinforced learning and mean field games as I just mentioned. So reinforcement is just a, a way to simultaneously learn and make decision-making problems in a sequential environment. And um, uh, mean field games is a, a model or linear model approximation of a large number of homogeneous speeders, but just replacing a lot of agents' uh, information, their actions, states, with just a population distribution. And so that it can be scalable and actually uh, independent of the size of the um, uh, number of agents. So uh, to solve the problem, uh, I just mentioned about something like the repeat ad auction game. People have proposed to just use uh, model it as an game and solve it use uh, standard multi-agent reinforcement algorithms. This can be achievable for moderately small n, but for moderately larger n, this can be easily a computation intractable because of exponential uh, growth in the number of, uh, size of the action and policy space. And um, so people have proposed to approximate things using things like, for example, independent learners, where you just uh, re, uh, re, uh, neglect all the interactions between the uh, agents, or use some first order uh, mean field approximation, for example, regard all the agent, other agents' information, replace it uh, with the mean of them. And our approach is basically uh, use uh, the full distribution uh, model for the MFG, and we consider the action coupling in the MFG, so we call it a GMFG, generalized MFG. We propose an algorithm called GMFQ to solve it. Um, we uh, establish the non symptotic uh, complexity of the algorithm, and also we test it on some ad auction games and show that it actually outperforms existing ones. Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you very much. All right, for our third student speaker, we have Ines. Hello. Um, so my research is focused on uh, representation learning, which is the task where we try to uh, map uh, discrete objects to continuous vector representations. Um, and more concretely, I'm focusing on hyperbolic embeddings um, and trying to understand how they can help in representation learning. And so hyperbolic geometry is a non-Euclidean geometry, um, which uh, theoretically has some guarantees to represent uh, hierarchical data or tree-like data. And the high level intuition for this is that the hyperbolic space is some sort of continuous version of trees essentially. And so, in our work, uh, we've explored different machine learning applications to understand where these representations could help. Um, so one example is our New York's paper from last year, where we found that hyperbolic embeddings can improve uh, the performance of uh, graph neural networks. Um, another example more recently is a knowledge graph. So we also found that hyperbolic embeddings um, can help on graphs that have some degree of hierarchy, like uh, taxonomies, for instance. 
Um, and we have open source code for both these projects. Um, papers are online, so feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. Or... Awesome, well, thank you very much, everyone. So I encourage the audience to, to feel free to ask any of the students or myself any questions. All right, so I'll start with the question actually for the students. Uh, so it's great to hear about, about these, these projects you're doing. Uh, maybe if you could each say a little bit more about what new research directions do you find the most interesting and impactful? And maybe we can start in the same order. So we can start with, uh, with Tanya. Um, so actually, currently, I'm interested in approximation theory. Um, so like we don't know what is the optimal amount of like layers or neurons for uh, a neural network to be able to approximate some certain functions. So uh, currently, like I'm looking uh, with Professor Eric Darf at uh, at uh, the DNN structure uh, such that we could approximate uh, analytically uh, continuable, fu uh, uh, continuable function in uh, Bernstein ellipse uh, arbitrarily close. And uh, now we're trying to see, um, uh, now we're experimenting and uh, the way we do this is by uh, looking at the uh, Yarotsky paper that was published in 2017, where he basically described uh, the ReLU network that can approximate uh, the multiplication x, y. And if we have multiplication, we can basically get any types of polynomials. And in particular, we work with Chebyshev polynomials. And we are trying to see uh, how much better, uh, how, how much more efficient, like in terms of convergence, is our DNN comparing to other DNN that has the same amount of layers. Uh, such that we could uh, approximate uh, some function arbitrarily close. Yeah. Okay, that's that's very interesting. Junji, do you want to sure. go next? Sure, thanks. Um, so I think, I think there are two problems I'm, uh, I think that will be really interesting and also challenging and impactful. Uh, and uh, the first one is actually related to the um, uh, work I just mentioned about the multi-agent reinforcement problems. So I think there, there's still a very large gap between the theory and practice in this field. Uh, people have, uh, uh, and companies have uh, proposed a lot of new um, like open source implementations and, uh, um, and agents like AlphaStar and others to solve the multi-agent reinforcement problems and uh, apply to in re reality and to beat the human experts in games and other fields. But um, and, and in the theory side, there is also a lot of uh, new works uh, studying the uh, both the collaborative and also competitive um, uh, uh, scenarios of the multi-agent uh, problems. But uh, up to now, I have felt that there is still a large gap between these two um, like branches or uh, two directions. So, for example, in the Nature paper by DeMind about AlphaStar, uh, the study like uh, um, like kind of I think a collaborative and competitive game. And I still use something like Nash uh, equilibrium concepts, but uh, the underlying theory and also the algorithm, many things are very different from the ones that people uh, recently published uh, in terms of the theory side. So I think there's a gap between that. I think it's, it'll be very good to uh, try to uh, at least close or shorten this uh, gap. And the second thing I think is very interesting is on um, the nonlinear uh, or non convex and the stochastic optimization solvers. So. Uh, for convex ones, um, we already have the CVX and SpacePy and, uh, and Mozy Grubby kind of solvers, modern languages, and other things. But for uh, non-convex ones, there are uh, some sporadic ones uh, lying over there on GitHub. But still, uh, for the um, things that can, people can use for, uh, off the shelf, like Mozy and Grubby, people are still, I think, in a, um, a large need of it, and uh, have, we haven't seen that. So I think that's also a very important direction, how to make the Nonlinear, non-convex solvers and uh, stochastic solvers available for people to use, just as you use things like Scikit-Learn uh, or uh, uh, those solvers in SciPy or other things. Yeah. So I think these two things are the things I think are very interesting. Okay. Very interesting. Thanks. Ines. Yes. Um, so personally, I'm really interested at uh, research problems that aim at bridging the gap between uh, discrete and continuous optimization worlds. Um, so people have been working on computationally hard problems uh, for a lot of times and developing solvers um, using randomized algorithms or uh, combinatorial algorithms. 
Uh, but more recently, there's been some work that is using uh, gradient-based optimization to solve these problems. Um, I think it's a really exciting direction to pursue, especially now that people are developing very powerful algorithms for uh, gradient descent, mini batch optimization, and also with the compute infrastructure that are evolving. Um, so on my end, this is what I found really interesting. And personally, um, I recently started working on hierarchical clustering, which is a discrete problem. And we framed it as a continuous optimization problem using um, hyperbolic embeddings again. Um, so if I had to pick one topic, that's definitely the direction that, I, that I'm excited about. Very cool, that's great. So here's one question for actually for, for Ines. So can you actually give some, some other examples? So you mentioned hardware clustering. So what are some other examples where people currently have to rely on discrete optimization, but where you think there could be a large gain from, from doing continuous optimization? So recently there's been some work trying to solve SAT problems um, with graph neural networks actually. So they solve the problem from a data-driven perspective, like rather than um, trying to search for solution, they give a network uh, several instances of problems and tell them if these are solved or unsolved. Uh, and they try to train the network to predict uh, whether the problem is uh, satisfiable or not. So that's one example. And I think recently I've seen papers on graph matching too, using graph neural networks again. Um, maximum flow problems also can be uh, framed using continuous optimization. So these are all different possibilities. Okay, great. There's a related question, which I think is also related to what, what yours, you just described and also what uh, Junji mentioned about non-complex optimizations, right? Because it seems like, especially when you're trying to convert SAP solvers and other things into continuous optimization, and the landscape could be very complicated and non-complex, right? Yeah. So maybe you could, both of you maybe comment a little bit more on, on what are the most exciting advances on the non-convex side that you think could, uh, could, could uh, address some of these challenges? Yeah, on our end, uh, for instance, for the hierarchical clustering, uh, the problem that we created, which is continuous, is obviously non-convex. And so it's kind of interesting to see that the hardness that arises from the discreteness of the original problem is now translated into an optimization challenge. So definitely we're not making an NP-hard problem not hard anymore, where we still have like to solve the non-convex part. Um, but this is interesting to compare, like given all the progresses with GPUs and optimization, can we maybe improve, um, improve over the discrete solvers? Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think um, the things are, uh, uh, from my viewpoint, like I have a um, uh, uh, like few backgrounds on the discrete optimization side, but uh, from my understanding of the other parts of the non-class optimization, I think one of the things uh, or most recent advances in uh, making it more practical is the joint, uh, joint, uh, mo joint modeling and uh, solving of the problem. So, um, for example, uh, many recent works starting from those uh, on matrix completion and now in policy grading, like for reinforcement learning, have shown that many, in many problems, actually the uh, problem structure uh, can ensure, ob ob objective structure mm -hmm. can ensure that actually simple algorithm like gradient descent or scarce gradient descent can co converge globally. And so I think the problem is basically how you can model the problem so that or, or uh, adjust or uh, tune the uh, hyperparameters to make sure that it can actually be solved by the solvers uh, with guarantees. Yeah, okay. I think that's also a very important direction. Like, I think there's also work in like uh, Berkeley on like uh, uh, predict and optimize. I think that's also relevant. Yeah, so that's Sorry. my understanding. And maybe just a quick last question, final questions for Tatiana. So you mentioned actually approximations using neural networks. Can you comment a little bit on, on the depth of the network? That you're looking at how, how depths play into it? Yeah, like, um, so uh, the num the depth comes with uh, uh, epsilon, like how close we want to approximate uh, the neural network. So uh, it is basically it, it is it is similar to the one that was derived by Yarotsky, um, that is log. Uh, uh, log one over epsilon. The, this is um, yeah. So we get uh, log one over epsilon layers and log one over epsilon and this thing squared uh, really units in order to approximate uh, using Chebyshev polynomials uh, analytic function arbitrarily close. Yeah. Great. Well, I think that's all the 
time that we have for, for questions. So thank you so much to all the students for, for sharing your really exciting work and for, uh, for sharing your insights. And now let's turn it over to, to Gianluca for the final closing remarks. I want to thank um, everybody for, for participating. This was uh, um, really a, a, a great experiment uh, when uh, we first realized that we were not going to have Expo Live. Um, it was uh, a moment in which we thought, you know, what, what should we do, uh, perhaps uh, uh, delay it or, or, or cancel it completely. I, I, want to, um, I want to say that uh, we immediately decided that we wanted to go ahead and, and definitely illustrate uh, and, and share with, with you what, what's happening, what we're doing. I think technically this went, uh, we went well. I, I think the, the um, uh, depth and the breadth of the content that you've seen is, a, is certainly a great representation of what happens in SME. Um, it's not uh, a sufficient representation. I certainly, um, uh, the, the, the limitation in terms of time are, are clearly uh, posing a, a, a constraint of what we can share with you. Um, but I, I do feel that this has been a, a great, um, great experience and, and certainly a, um, a fantastic opportunity for us to continue to, to share the great work that happens uh, at Stanford in, in ICME and beyond ICME, I should say, as well. Um, so uh, in terms of final words, um, I, I do want to um, start by saying that uh, uh, you have seen uh, a, a variety of topics is exposed. Uh, you have seen a, a really interesting blend between uh, uh, technical uh, content and, and the complexity of uh, approaching computational mathematics uh, and computational uh, science uh, in, in the world of today, where we have you know, complex problems, problems that in, you know, involve and require a multidisciplinary outlook, um, but also a very good, strong focus on, uh, on innovative technology, innovative, innovating uh, computing, computing on different platforms, how that addresses uh, problems at different scales from, from the human, from the personal side, all the way to the society and, and planet scale. So I think this is really a, a great um, summary, in my opinion, of what, uh, what ICME really stands for. Um, now, in terms of final words, I do want to start by uh, thanking the, the organizing team, uh, Karen, Corinne, Jess, Stacy, and Judy have been uh, fantastic in putting this together, um, working with the Stanford video team to uh, sort of ma manage the, the, technical, the technical aspects of it, uh, but also in terms of coordination, and, and you've seen a number of different speakers and, and moderators coming on board, and I certainly want to thank all of them for the preparation that was required this is certainly more than, than usual. Um, uh, coordination and, and organization were actually quite, quite um, uh, ex exceptional behind the scenes. In addition to the speakers and the moderators that you have seen uh, uh, presenting, I, I do want to thank all the students that submitted uh, the research summaries. You know, obviously, one big chunk of, uh, of Expo over the years has been the poster session, where we have a, an opportunity to mingle and talk about uh, different projects, uh, you know, get to know each other in, in, a, in a different capacity. Unfortunately, that part is not really uh, possible um, online. Uh, but I do want to, uh, um, you know, do want to recognize the students and, uh, and, and everybody that submitted the, those research summaries. This is a good uh, sort of a, a, a pinpointing good, uh, useful research areas that might be a starting point for connections later. Uh, I, I also want to do a special thank for David, uh, David Zhang, who is uh, one of our ICME PhD students that actually provided some of the musical intermissions that you've seen in between sessions, actually at the beginning and at the end of the, of the conference. Um, they, David is a, is a great help every time we, we sort of get together. Uh, it, it's nice to hear uh, his, uh, his musical talent in addition to all the other talents that he has. So um, in addition to, to uh, Sort of thanking the people that made this happen, and obviously this is really what what I'm doing here. Everybody that worked in ICME to to make the conference happen. I do want to spend a minute thanking you, the the audience, and and mostly, uh, most importantly, all the uh, partners that work with us uh, over the years um, uh, to to make our program 
not only exciting for our students, but also impactful and relevant for the, for the community out there. Um, we, we have uh, an, a number of different ways we, we can interact with, with you, uh, with you all, and, and we certainly are, are open to, to even more ideas. Um, I, I do want to point out that uh, um, over the years we've been able to uh, form very, very strong connections. We have been able to uh, expand our portfolio, both in terms of research and, and, and curriculum, just because of the interactions with you. So I want to thank you for, for being partners with us. And uh, I want to do uh, also, I want to thank Apple, who is uh, the new um, affiliate partner starting from last year, just, just joined our, our program. So the program continues to expand in, in areas that, uh, that cover sort of the breadth of, of ICME uh, activities. Um, I also want to uh, uh, give a, a special thank to our strategic partners. These are partners that engage with us at the, at the level that is uh, um, higher in the terms of uh, uh, interactions. We, we build uh, programs together. We, we you know, um, uh, build research activities, fund uh, PhD students. So there are a lot of things that we do together. There have been uh, uh, fellowships, uh, uh, um, fellowship students that have been funded by Total as Lamberger, for example. Google was mentioned before as a, as a partner in, uh, in uh, organizing the AI seminar. So again, uh, thank you very much for, for your uh, vision and for your commitment to, to ICME and to all of us in, in our mission moving forward. So uh, um, without further ado, I wanna thank you all for attending. This is the, the last slide and the last piece of the, of the uh, Expo uh, 2020 conference. Um, I, I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. This was stimulating and exciting for you to, to hear more about what we are doing. Uh, I wanna say once again, that there, there is obviously a lot more uh, about ICME that uh, we are more than willing to share with you. Uh, the, the student research guide was already shared and, and it's certainly something that we encourage you to, to look at and perhaps contact the, the students and the faculty that are engaged in specific uh, areas that might be of your interest. Uh, in addition, um, the, our website is a good place to, to get um, sort of a, a broad understanding and broad connections with everything we do. And, and also our YouTube channel, um, uh, Karen was mentioned before, all the AI, AI seminars are, are shared on the YouTube uh, channel. We'll be sharing this video, uh, the, the live cast for the Expo conference on our website. So certainly that's a, a great place to to see what has happened in the past, but also to keep updated with what will happen in the future. So without, um, uh, I don't have anything else to say. I just wanna uh, thank you all again. Um, very grateful that, that you participated. Just one note, uh, we had uh, more than 300 participants uh, at, uh, signed up at the conference, more than 350 actually. So that's a great success, and, and in a sense, the silver lining is that we would never be able to um, reach too ma so many of you in a live conference on campus. Uh, we, we really don't have the capacity to have all of you uh, joining. So in that sense, um, this is a great uh, success, and I'm happy that uh, we were able to connect with so many of you over, over, uh, uh, over the live, live stream. Um, so thank you very much, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Make sure you get in touch with me, with Corinne, with Karen, who, you know, with ICME in general, if you have specific questions or you want to know more about what we do. And uh, we'll keep you posted with what happens next in terms of our events and our activities. And also uh, as we move forward in the summer uh, with the summer workshops that many of you might be of interest, might be interested in, in joining. Okay, so thank you very much, and uh, we'll uh, basically stop here, and uh, uh, thank you again for participating.